Kazushigi Najima is a scenario writer, narrative designer, and director who's become increasingly synonymous with Final Fantasy VII in recent years, and for many is lumped in with the likes of Tetsuya Nomura and Yoshinori Katase as a latter-day ambassador of Final Fantasy VII material. Indeed, at the time of the original game's release in 1997, Najima was hailed alongside Nomura and Katase as representative of the New Guard Squaresoft team, which, while being true insofar as it was Najima's first major credit on a Final Fantasy game, is somewhat ignorant to the fact that by 1997, Najima was already a veteran of the games industry and had been involved in games about as long as series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi. So, how did Kazushiki Najima build out his career before arriving at Squaresoft? Why, unlike his peers, has he not ascended the ranks to become a director, producer, or executive in his own right? And why is it only comparatively recently that he is being discussed in game circles with any real renown or indeed controversy? Well, beginning at the beginning, Najima's career kicked off in the early 1980s at the now defunct, but at one time very well regarded, Data East Studio. This was an entertainment company known primarily for making pinball machines and arcade games, though as the popularity of home consoles started to increase, Data East gradually shifted into other genres and other types of games, and indeed the side-scrolling beat-em-up Kung Fu, otherwise known as Spartan X by Takashi Nishiyama, was one of the first video games I ever played, and I was absolutely obsessed with this game, even though it was uh, an outlier genre for Data East. But looking to Kazushige Najima and his career here, the pivot into console gaming for Data East afforded him the opportunity to work on some vaguely narrative-driven titles, such as Detective Jake, an adventure mystery title, Glory of Hercules, which was an RPG series, and the infancy of Data East's experience in console games and console genres perhaps afforded Najima these early chances to learn as he was doing, both writing and directing while at Data East. Off the back of the moderate success uh, of these games, particularly Glory of Hercules, Najima quickly jumped ship to Squaresoft in 1994 and was immediately handed his second and only director credit at the company to this day, which was Bahamut Lagoon, a game that is also notable for being Najima's first of many collaborations with recurring Final Fantasy writer and director Motomu Toriyama. Now, Bahamut Lagoon was met with a lukewarm reception at release, and it's always been quite intriguing to me because it does stand distinct as one of Najima's only and last director's role. And if we dig a little deeper and look at two interviews from this period, Najima does frequently lament how loose and disconnected the final game felt for him, and in particular its story. And so, perhaps the responsibility of assembling a game and all of these constituent parts together from other writers, other artists and planners may not have suited him as much personally or professionally as was the, the primary skill set that he has uh, of writing scenario. So from the few interviews of the time, this, this is what we tend to, to glimpse from that. On top of this, barely before Bahamut Lagoon was even finished, Najima was being brought in to write early scripts and early drafts of what would become Final Fantasy VII, and it's here that, as with the other alumni of this project, which I've previously discussed, he was springboarded into a career high off the back of the game's success when it was released in 1997. Now, one of the things that's debated to this day is the question of credit, the question of who's responsible for what aspects of a game or a story or a character, and this particularly holds true, I think, for Final Fantasy over the years, with prominent personnel and various receptions to games making credit or blame become a frequently discussed thing. So, where some people argue that Final Fantasy VII is a, a Nomura thing, or a Katase thing, or a Sakaguchi thing, uh, the fact remains that it is a broadly ensemble effort, particularly as discussed in my Hironobu Sakaguchi episode. Uh, that was the ethos and the means of direction and leadership that he sort of embedded in the Squaresoft team, uh, particularly those working on the Final Fantasy games. And so, the way that Kazushige Najima as a scenario writer fit into this ensemble was writing out the game story ahead of time, uh, based on early ideas, early pitch meetings, bringing these ideas into later meetings, taking on board the team's own ideas and their feedback, and then refining the story as they went. So very much a process of refinement, 
over the course of the game's development. But what Nojima really established in Final Fantasy VII, and I think is his consistent strength to this day, is the focus on characters. And where a broad team may build out the breadth of a story and the events that happen, the mechanics that, that are used in the game that the scenario writer would have to work backwards from to legitimise why they're there or explain why they're there. Najima himself is really good at giving depth to character stories uh, to which those events are happening. And any players of Final Fantasy VII and the compilation material today probably have an idea in their heads of how a Cloud or a Tifa or a Barret may respond to something happening to them based on the fidelity and the nuance and the quality of how Najima writes them on the page. And the way he ran with Sakaguchi and Katase's suggestions and Nomura's designs, of course, bringing those characters to life uh, was a great testament to Kazushige Najima's efforts uh, on this title. Moving on to Final Fantasy VIII, and as discussed in my recent Yoshinori Katase episode, this was the proving ground in many ways for those that had taken up the mantle uh, of Sakaguchi's creation, and it does remain one of the more controversial and unique installments of the Final Fantasy series. For his part, and at Katase's insistence, the story of Final Fantasy VIII hinged around the duo of Squall and Renoa more so than any other character, and the broader cast was written broadly to orbit and elevate these two key characters. However, Najima, ever in his fashion of giving depth, context, and historicity to characters, really went to town on developing the Laguna story, such that in the earlier drafts of the game, it was about a 50-50 split between Squall's adventure and Laguna's adventure. And I think this is one of Najima's great traits, and why so many Final Fantasy worlds and characters feel lived in, and they have such three-dimensionality, because even though this stuff gets chopped and changed and edited down, the fact that it has been written and the residue of these character histories are still there and present in the game, um, with Zack Fair and the Nibelheim incident being a comparable instance in Final Fantasy VII, really informing the contemporary characters, it really amplifies these game stories and characters compared to other RPGs that were around at the time. Coming on to Final Fantasy X, uh, this game was pretty wild in terms of personnel. It, it had around five or six writer credits on it, including Yoshinori Katase, Tetsuya Nomura, Motomu Toriyama, uh, so a very collaborative effort here. Very hard to offer credit to any single individual, as usual, as we've discussed, but broadly speaking, looking back, I am amazed that with so many writers and so many personalities involved in Final Fantasy X, that it was as succinctly told and brilliantly structured and paced as it ended up being. And regarding Najima's role specifically here, we can glimpse from interviews at the time of how Najima can work as much as a reactive writer as an active one. So what I mean by this is where his scenarios are often written in advance, uh, as concepts and then refined and edited down as a project wears on. He has something of a chicken and egg relationship with team members like character designer Tetsuya Nomura, and in this instance, in Final Fantasy X, Nomura designed the character of Kamari Ronso with a broken horn, for example. He showed it to Nojima and said, I don't know why this guy's horn is broken, come up with some backstory for him. And so Kamari's design spun out into this really interesting world-building micro-narrative of Baran and Yankee Ronso having broken his horn off, um, this very alpha vibe of the Ronso tribe, and, and all of that sort of thing. So Najima really fleshed out this game in small ways as a reaction to how he was seeing finished the character designs. Najima was also chiefly responsible for one of the most unique and I think well-structured aspects of Final Fantasy X, that really anchored the story, which was writing a draft scenario from Tidus's perspective, and where Tidus is the newcomer and narrator for the world of Spira. So it's that classic case of him discovering things at the same time the player does, being that very organic window into events sort of character that I thought worked really well um, for this particular world where so many of the concepts need explaining to a real world audience. So, huge collaborative effort on Final Fantasy X there. Now, coming further into the 2000s, we have Najima collaborating with Tetsuya Nomura on the latter's breakout directorship project uh, of Kingdom Hearts as a scenario writer. And as discussed in my Nomura episode, the Kingdom Hearts saga grew increasingly unwieldy as time wore on. It's often targeted for its writing, and it did have 
quite a few collaborators supporting Nomura here. However, in terms of Kazushige Najima's involvement in the game, he actually only came in during the final stages and actually wrote from the final act of the game onwards. And one of the distinctions of being a scenario writer in games, rather than, for example, a screenwriter or a novelist, that isn't often appreciated, is you are often required to creatively write reasons why players need to repeat gameplay, or why gameplay works the way it does, or legitimise why certain locations need to be revisited, <laughs> which is basically a production thing. It's because they need to reuse assets to cut down on production costs and game size and so on. So while, yes, Kazushige Nojima is pretty well regarded as a creative writer, his inclusion in Kingdom Hearts seems like it had that pragmatic cost-cutting aspect to it as well. So indeed, if we recall the final act of the game, which is where uh, Kazushige Nojima was brought in to write, we have Hollow Bastion, uh, we have the dungeon that leads us up to Cernobog, and actually in that phase of the game, we revisit every game location to open a treasure chest or something. So basically extending the final dungeon, bloating it out with reused assets. And then of course we have our final battle at Destiny Island. So a classic scenario writer involvement there, um, if we're really looking for it. Now, as discussed with all my prior discussions on the Squaresoft team, uh, coming into 2003 is where things get interesting at Squaresoft. It's this pivotal moment often talked about where we have Sakaguchi's departure, the Square Enix merger, so on and so forth. And each of the, the key personnel at Square kind of had some sort of progression or departure or, or change happening here in terms of their output. For Kazushige Nojima's part, he decided to go freelance uh, at this stage, starting his own company, Stella Vista, which he still operates from to this day, which is not particularly controversial. You know, he may well have left because things were getting a bit toxic at Square, we don't know, but it's not particularly controversial that a game writer is working in a freelance capacity, and in fact I think it's more common than not for a game writer to be a contractor or a freelancer going from studio to studio rather than being kind of a staff member. So if nothing else, uh, Kazushige Nijima was able to sell his services back to Square Enix at a better rate than as a full-time employee. But it was also around this time that a lot of the misgivings about Final Fantasy and its team began to take hold, and Najima, for his part, has broadly been spared being targeted for this, probably be because he's never opted to take on a director or a producer or a, a proper kind of leading project role in these games, but he does stick to the disciplines of writing. That said, he does still take some flack for his involvement in the expanding and sequelizing of Final Fantasy material over this first decade of the 2000s, with Final Fantasy X-2 being a game that he wrote, and actually a game that he didn't actually want made, being a prime example of that. Compilation material of Final Fantasy VII being another one, and the Kingdom Hearts uh, saga being yet another still. And again, I think some of the criticisms misunderstand Najima's role in these projects, or, or the role of a scenario writer, as we've kind of touched on here. It's, it's more of a utility role than necessarily a creative role uh, a lot of the time. And regarding Final Fantasy VII, uh, as mentioned in my Nomura episode, it does make sense to me that those who created these characters and created these stories took ownership of them rather than handing them off to others who may not understand the characters as well. So I do give a fair amount of leeway to both Nomura and, and Kazushige Nojima in terms of maintaining oversight of how, for example, Cloud Strife is written, how Sephiroth is written, so on. So uh, being a contractor in this period, afforded Najima other opportunities to work at other studios on other projects, and he's done a, a wide range of things in, in in the space of time since 2003. You know, he's worked for Nintendo, he's worked for Capcom, working on a broad range of titles from Super Smash Bros, uh, Dragon's Dogma Online, a bunch of RPGs, action RPGs, and stuff like that outside of the Final Fantasy anthology. Although, of course, he did continue to supervise on the writing, such as initial concept writing for both Final Fantasy XIII, which was later taken up by Toriyama, Final Fantasy XV, which was later taken on by a bunch of writers and helmed by Hajime Tabata, and later, of course, with the remake games, where he once again collaborated with Toriyama, Nomura, and Katase. So we've seen thus far that Najima is prolific in his writing, and he's involved with the Final Fantasy brand to this day from both a concepting 
and a scenario refining perspective. But what Najima has also been indulging since about the mid-2000s, and has I think contributed perhaps to the latter-day attention on him, both positive and negative, is branching out into novelizations of Final Fantasy media, uh, specifically the Final Fantasy VII material, beginning with On the Way to a Smile, and the post-Final Fantasy X-2 dramatizations in X-2.5 and the Final Fantasy X Will audio drama, for example. And it's here that we see some shifts in perceptions of Najima. Uh, for example, as someone that never even wanted a Final Fantasy X sequel, but then started with these odd continuities, uh, it seems a bit weird, perhaps hypocritical to some audiences. And the literature itself uh, is somewhat divisive, which is a subjective point, but it hasn't been universally received. So for my part, um, I certainly prefer some of the novels more than others. I also think whenever dealing with foreign language media, we need to acknowledge the translator's approach too. They have a degree of creative input and interpretation of a text. So in this case, we had Melissa Tanaka for the early novels, uh, and then we had uh, latterly uh, Stephen Kohler for the uh, traces of two pasts and, and those more recent novels. And ultimately, taking a step back and looking at what most of these novelizations are doing, it does play to the aforementioned traits and strengths of Najima that I've mentioned here, which is basically creating character portraits, character vignettes, and looking to On the Way to a Smile, for example, we have these episodes, we have episode Denzel, episode Tifa, snapshots into the thoughts and feelings of these characters. Likewise, in Traces of Two Pasts, we have the Tifa focus, the Tifa perspective on her backstory, then we have the Aerith perspective on her backstory. And again, in Final Fantasy X 2.5, we have the Tidus story and the Yuna story. So really, barring some small plot progressions and then world building elements, uh, what Najima is doing here is offering further depth to characters that we already know, and thus, regardless of our opinions on how they're written or the actual output, I think it is just an extension of his narrative design work on games, and these vignettes are almost like the character synopsis that you would pair with designs when pitching your ideas to teams and stuff like that. It's just been adapted to the form of creative writing. So, as we've seen here, Kazushige Najima is nothing short of prolific in his output, having been writing now for the better part of 40 years, dipping into screenplays and teleplays with the likes of Advent Children, The Last Order anime, novelizations, and of course, working to his core skill set of scenario writing for RPGs, culminating lately in the action RPG uh, Reinatis for Nintendo Switch and the Final Fantasy VII remake games. So what I've sought to cover here is Najima's career in brief, but also the limits and the parameters of a scenario writer's responsibility too, because it's not simply a discipline similar to screenwriting, where initial ideas and drafts get chopped and changed in development, but it's also a craft where often finished gameplay finished character designs or system mechanics are brought to a writer and they are asked to fill in the blanks uh, by giving a, a reason for this stuff existing. So it's a practical as much as a creative craft and I think testament to Najima's demeanour here is the ability to have collaborated and compromised on so many of his projects, um, not being precious about functional changes to someone's work while still keeping one's name in the credits for it. Uh, and at 60 years old, much like the other Square team members like Sakaguchi, perhaps even Katase, I'm not sure how long Najima will go on for, uh, how much engine he has left, but he has certainly been consistent through both the highs and lows of Final Fantasy's development and doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider joining me on Patreon. Alternatively, if you feel like donating me a coffee, you can do so. The links are available below.